B, why don't you come on up, B, from B. Edwards from the Government Accountability Project. It'll take just a second to get some slides organized as we go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. There, uh, so I just hit down. Well, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to be the following speaker after Eileen. Uh, but I did want to tell you uh, a little bit about my organization in the United States. Um, I'm the director of the Government Accountability Project, and we are a whistleblower protection organization in Washington. We operate as a law firm and as a non-governmental organization, so we work on policies, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were founded in 1979 in the wake of the Watergate scandal in the U.S., which... Uh, if you recall, occasioned the resignation of President Nixon. In the aftermath of that scandal, it occurred to a couple of lawyers working in Washington that there were people in the administration, in the White House, in the Department of Justice, who wanted to speak out at the time and talk about what was happening, but who couldn't do so safely because there were no laws to protect them and, and, and they would have been subject to the most ferocious retaliation. Uh, clearly, even people who didn't speak out were subjected to retaliation and, and reprisal. And so two lawyers started working in the United States in 1979 to found the Government Accountability Project and, and to establish a law to protect whistleblowers. And that law was finally passed in 1989, so it was 10 years before we had any law that protected even federal government uh, whistleblowers officially. The effectiveness of that law uh, is questionable even now, um, but it is in effect and it does give us a hook to work with as we try to protect uh, whistleblowers in the federal government. I wanted to talk this morning, though, about international uh, whistleblowers who are in an even more precarious position than whistleblowers who are operating in a national context. So I'm going to talk about three cases that we had at GAP Beginning about 2005, we started to represent whistleblowers who were talking about uh, misconduct, wrongdoing, fraud, corruption at the international level and found themselves without any kind of protection or defense. And these are whistleblowers who come to us from the intelligence community, the national security apparatus in the United States, from international organizations like the United Nations, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, et cetera, and from corporations that operate internationally. All of these kinds of institutions play a shell game with whistleblower protections. That is, they move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and they, they uh, hold up any kind of anti-retaliation measure in endless administrative proceedings until the whistleblower can no longer uh, fight them. So I'll talk first about these three cases, the disclosures and the issues raised. The first case is Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden is a GAP client. Uh, we represent him in the US legal system on issues that don't pertain to the criminal case against him. Uh, he is, as you know, uh, an employee, he was an employee for a contractor of the National Security Agency. He exposed mass surveillance. And he raised an important question in the international uh, context. That is, what happens when the security demands of one country conflict with the sovereignty of other countries? And this is a question uh, that, that came to me in the aftermath of his disclosures when some of us were, were having a teleconference uh, among NGOs that protect whistleblowers. And, and someone asked in that teleconference um, what the impact of the Snowden disclosures were. And as an American citizen, I started talking about the constitutional issues that Snowden's information brought up, that he was exposing activities 
um, taken over many years that violated the Constitution of the United States. The, the First Amendment, which protects free speech, the Fourth Amendment, which protects freedom of association, and the Fifth Amendment that protects us from, from self-incrimination. And so uh, in, the, in, the, in the framework of national law in the United States, Edward Snowden was reporting that the government of the US was, was guilty of crimes. So our German counterpart, who was on the phone then, said to me, so what you're telling me is that it's not OK for your government to spy on you, but it is OK for your government to spy on me. And I, I really didn't have uh, a ready response for that, for that um, question, really. It, it, the only thing you can say is, well, define OK, because uh, it's clearly not OK for the government of the United States to spy on the citizens of other countries who are not suspected of a crime. But legally, there isn't any defense or any, um, any remedy for that practice undertaken at the international level. And the other question Snowden raised is, does one country have the right to subject the citizens of another country to actions that would be illegal in the country taking them? So here we are again. The US government is spying on innocent people. But this would be illegal in the United States, but it's not illegal internationally. And that left Snowden in this no man's land he was reporting crimes taken by the government of the United States in the United States, but he was also reporting things that the government of the United States regarded as legal. And in that sense, people who would have defended him in the US were saying, we can't defend him because he isn't a whistleblower. He's a traitor, and he has revealed national security practices that should never have been revealed under the laws of the United States. And I'm not going to talk too much more about the Snowden disclosures. Everyone's familiar with them, and we've talked about them a great deal. In another context, uh, whistleblowing is even more complex. We have the case of a woman named Aicha El Basri uh, at the United Nations. You think of the United Nations as this kind of benign organization that brings the voice of reason to conflict uh, situations around the world. In reality, the United Nations is a composite of governments, and it operates in a highly politicized environment. It's very difficult to negotiate the internal procedures of the UN, and whistleblowers there find themselves in a lot of trouble very quickly if they expose anything that is happening internal to the organization that the, internal, that the organization would be embarrassed by. So Al Basri reported, she was a spokeswoman for the UN mission in Darfur. And the party line on Darfur at this point is that the conflict has been abated. The UN peacekeeping forces are there. And uh, compared to what was happening, say, five, six years ago, uh, the situation is somewhat pacified, and the UN has it under control. El Basri, as the spokeswoman for the UN uh, peacekeeping mission there, which operates in conjunction with the African Union, found that she was being told to tell the press things that were patently untrue and that the UN was attributing to insurgent forces atrocities, mass killings, mass rapes, attacks on non-combatants. These were being attributed to insurgent forces when, in fact, they were being perpetrated by the government and the military forces of the government of Sudan. So she tried within the UN to get this, um, to get this addressed, and it wasn't. And, and she resigned her post, I think, in 2013, after serving for about a year. She had to finally go to the press itself 
to find some kind of, uh, of platform from which to speak because the UN had bottled up the truth about what was happening. And she was dealing with a situation in which national crimes were really crimes against humanity. They were, they were crimes that needed to be addressed in the, the, the forum of protection of human rights and not in a national forum. The government of Darfur and the government of Sudan were obviously not going to deal with what was happening because they were the perpetrators of what was happening. And the UN was dependent and is dependent on the goodwill of the country where it's operating in a peacekeeping capacity in order to stay in the country. After El Basri's um, allegations were investigated by the UN, the government in Khartoum asked the UN peacekeeping forces to leave. Uh, and that's what's being uh, negotiated now. So her disclosures raise this question, who's responsible for crimes against humanity if we can't go to a national government and we can't go to an intergovernmental organization? And the final case that we represent at the international level that I was going to talk about is a whistleblower named Eric Ben Artsy. He worked for Deutsche Bank in New York uh, and Berlin. He was what's called a risk management analyst, a quantitative analyst. He's a mathematician. His disclosures are very complex and involved, but he went to his superiors prior to the financial collapse in, in, 2008, in September of 2008 and told Deutsche Bank that the bank had assumed more risk on the investment portfolio it was holding then it could redeem with the capital assets that it held. So that in blunt terms, Deutsche Bank was at that moment technically insolvent. And the bank was concealing this from its shareholders, from its board, and from its investors. And, and of course, we all found out in September of 2008 the degree to which major financial institutions around the world are interconnected so that if Deutsche Bank is insolvent, so is Citigroup, so is Bank of America, so is J.P. Morgan Chase, because if one bank goes down, the assets of the others are, are virtually worthless. And in the end, in the U.S., the taxpayer had to bail out the Wall Street financial institutions to the tune of nearly a trillion dollars. Ben Artsy had reported this internally to the bank uh, prior to the collapse, and he lost his job through a protracted series of uh, retaliatory events. He's been blacklisted and has uh, very, very few prospects for future employment. But he raised the question, how does a national law enforcement agency investigate multinational banking fraud. It was impossible. The mechanisms aren't there. And what is national jurisdiction is responsible for international financial crimes. We talk about, in retrospect, at least in the US, um, what happened in 2008 as a financial crisis. But really, it was a financial crime. Everything that was done by the financial institutions that brought about the, the collapse. And the collapse did occur. We talk about it as nearly occurring or being narrowly avoided. It wasn't avoided. It did occur. And it was, it was a result of assumption of risk in sophisticated securities that were sold to investors on, under false pretenses. And the people who sold them knew exactly what they were doing, and they knew what the consequences could be. They simply hoped to avoid the consequences, and they padded their own comp compensation packages in doing that. So what happened to the whistleblowers, and how can they be protected? Well, we know what happened to Snowden. He's in exile in Russia at this moment. <coughs> it's worth uh, talking about a little bit the Espionage Act, which was used to prosecute him. He's been uh, 
charged but not indicted. There is not, so far as we know, a grand jury uh, investigating Snowden or his disclosures. But the Espionage Act of 1917 is a hundred year old law. It, it, was, it was passed in the, in the heat of World War I because Americans were paranoid about what German citizens might do on behalf of, uh, of their home country. And so the law was developed to, to go after spies, not whistleblowers. And, and as a result, it's a very blunt instrument to use against uh, a whistleblower. As we saw in the Manning case, the, the Bradley-Chelsea Manning case uh, that preceded the Snowden disclosures, uh, Manning could not present in a military tribunal a public interest defense. A national court wouldn't entertain a public interest defense either. So that the person being prosecuted couldn't say, well, it's true, I revealed classified information, but the classified information in turn described a crime and that the public had a right to know what its government was doing. There's no public interest, there's no affirmative defense that uh, the defendant can use. The government need not show harm either. If you reveal, the government can classify embarrassing information, make it secret, and then if someone reveals that information, the government is not obliged to demonstrate in a court that there was harm done to the national security of the United States. In the Manning case, the government began to do some kind of assessment of the harm that was done by the, by the public exposure of the Afghan and the, and the Iraq war logs, but it never finished the, the assessment, it never presented any assessment of what harm was done by Manning. Nonetheless, he was subject to more than three decades of incarceration. That's the penalty that Snowden would also face if he returned to the United States. The trial proceedings under the Espionage Act are largely secret, so the press would not have access, nor would uh, the public. We, we saw from what happened in uh, the process of uh, Snowden's detention or, or being stranded in, in Russia that allied governments would not protect him, and as a result, he's in exile. Uh, Aicha al-Basri was terminated. She's blacklisted for further work. She has no labor rights at all. International organizations are, have legal immunities from all national laws. They enjoy the immunities that an embassy in a foreign country enjoys. But unlike embassies, which are subject to their own national legal regimes, International govern, intergovernmental organizations are not subject to the laws of any country. Therefore, a, a whistleblower there is bottled up in internal administrative tribunal proceedings that are secret. They take, on average, three or four years to, um, to be processed. In the meantime, no press is allowed, no public uh, disclosures are made, and by the time the whistleblower gets through this administrative proceeding, the world has moved on, nobody cares anymore, the whistleblower has been uh, devastated, and the issue is gone. So, and that is what is happening to IHL Basri right now. Ben Artsy uh, was terminated and blacklisted. He has a civil suit against his employer. He's tried to make use of the reforms that were passed under the Dodd-Frank legislation in 2010. These are largely inoperative. And again, they take a long time to wind their way through the courts. So, what we see from international scale whistleblowers, these are not trivial disclosures. They're crimes against humanity. They're, um, they're civil rights violations on a mass scale. They're financial frauds that are capable of bringing down the capitalist system. And, and if we didn't have whistleblowers in these various organizations, we would never have known that these things were happening. 
The effects of the retaliation are potentially long-term incarceration, marginalization, such as Ms. Chubb uh, explained, professional ruin, physical danger, et cetera. And there are very, very few uh, avenues open for any kind of protection or compensation. What you, you should see from, from some of these cases is that our, our best shot at protecting these people has been through the press, not through the courts, and not through legislation. It is the press that has protected Edward Snowden best. It's uh, the fact that El Basri went to the press and publicized her disclosures. That created a bubble of, of safety around her. The higher her profile, the more difficult it is to attack her. And the same with Ben Artsy. The Financial Times exposed uh, what was happening to him and has kept something of a spotlight on him. At GAP, then, what we try to do with cases like this, as time passes, is to keep them in the public eye so that people don't forget the whistleblower. There are many, many organizations that focus on the disclosure, that are concerned about uh, civil rights violations and human rights violations and financial fraud. But lost in the shuffle is what has happened to the person who brought them, brought these, these crimes to the public attention. Um, it's also the case that uh, we don't want to live in a society that depends on whistleblowers for knowledge about crimes of this scale. When we depend on in individual people, we're, we're, we're asking a single person to go up against a system, an entire institution, a federal government, a multinational corporation with very little protection and very few resources. So in that kind of a battle, the individual is going to lose. There is absolutely no way a single person can do battle with Deutsche Bank or the United Nations or the government of the United States. And therefore, what we need are credible, non-governmental organizations working together working with the press, working with the public to defend not just, um, not, to not just address the crimes exposed, but to defend the whistleblower as time goes by. And, and we are um, making progress on this front. We, we established uh, some time ago the Whistleblower International Net whistleblowing international network. We have an executive uh, secretariat and a steering committee. These are the organizations on the steering committee. GAP in the United States, ODAC in South Africa, Public Concern at Work here in the UK, Commonwealth Initiative for Human Rights in India, FAIR in Canada, which has fallen on hard times, Center for Human Rights in Chile, and Whistleblowers Network in Germany. And, and working together, the way WIN works is that if a whistleblower goes to a non-governmental organization in a particular country and that NGO is unable to protect the whistleblower effectively, that NGO contacts the network and asks for the technical expertise or the resources to help uh, protect that person. Um, the one case I wanted to mention where we, we, we managed to act quickly and effectively was a case of an IBM whistleblower in Ireland who had blown the whistle on uh, misconduct in this international corporation. They charged her criminally with stealing two flash drives. Uh, and this is something that happens. One, when a whistleblower goes public, the press is often asking for proof, for documents. If the whistleblower, however, takes documents from a private employer, they can be charged criminally with theft. 
the IBM added an additional wrinkle to that. That is, they charged her with the theft of two flash drives, and she'd only taken one. So she returned the one flash drive, but she couldn't return the second one because it didn't exist. And so they could, uh, under the laws of the country, incarcerate her pending the, the return of this second flash drive. The, the, the NGO, which was Transparency International in Ireland, called GAP, and we have a legal expert on this kind of criminal proceeding who intervened immediately to exonerate the whistleblower and mitigate the circumstances so that there was time to mount uh, a legal defense for her and avoid incarceration. Um, what the network is trying to do is, is to organize then whistleblower protection organizations. We work together with networks of journalists, technologists, and lawyers, and all groups met in Amsterdam uh, in June of this year to establish um, a, an action plan. So this is where we are, and this is why I'm here. Uh, I, I wanted to make it clear that if national level whistleblowers are in danger and are facing the kind of retaliation that Eileen talked about, international whistleblowers are even more exposed. And, and the crimes that they reveal are appalling. When El Basri came to us to tell us what was really happening in Darfur, which has slipped out of the news over the last few years, it was astonishing that no one was doing anything. And when we realize how much we depend on these single people to tell us about crimes of this scale, so now, say, thanks to Snowden, we know what the NSA is doing somewhat, but since he left the NSA in 2013, we're not sure what they're doing since then. Since Aicha El Basri left the UN mission a year ago, we don't know what's happening in Darfur. We don't know what's happening in Somalia or the Democratic Republic of Congo or, or Haiti. Uh, we can't be dependent on single individuals, and so there are two things we have to do. We have to begin to establish mechanisms that are more systematic about international regulations and a way to address international crimes. And we have to protect whistleblowers where they are uh, when they face retaliation that is ruinous personally and professionally so that in the interim more of them come forward. Thank you. Thanks. We have, we have some time for questions. Uh, just a few announcements. One of them is that we have a, a special guest who's coming uh, in this very area of whistleblowing, and uh, hopefully he'll be here fairly soon. Um, I'll let you know when, when he arrives. Uh, he's probably the best known whistleblower in the United States, and uh, we're very pleased to, to welcome him when he comes. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's, we're, we're getting to that. That's right. <laughs> I think we can now take questions. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right over here. We'll take that one down. That's fine. Thank you. Um, well, uh, my first question is about uh, international uh, uh, my one question is about international whistleblowers, and um, I'm asking because um, I, until a few months ago, I also used to um, work with the United Nations in, in Iraq. Um, one one pressure, one one thing we always discuss. Uh, I mean, w um, uh, I'm aware of the bureaucracy and the difficulty and in how international NGOs and the United Nations is sometimes caught in this pickle where they have to uh, tiptoe around local governments so the local governments would allow us to stay and work. Um, but one thing uh, that me and a lot of friends 
very frustrated with, with, um, with just slow bureaucracy and everything is if there was a means to put pressure on local governments by international donors. So let's say if the, um, if, if, um, if a, if the American a government, an American aid uh, fund was, say, funding something in Iraq, they would put a condition as a result of a whistleblower, let's say in Darfur, where they would put a condition to say, these are the transparency practices we want as a donor. This is how you will report uh, your spendings. This is the overhead you can put on staff salaries. This is what we want you to do, or we're not donating millions of dollars for this aid. And I'm just wondering um, if, uh, uh, if you think that there's a way of, of also making this happen through your, uh, um, uh, through your network of, of whistleblowers, because at the end of the day, the point of blowing the whistle is to make things happen, and we're not going to affect the policies, let's say, in Sudan or Iraq um, that way, but, but money uh, definitely does an influence. B, if you want to come up, so we only have one microphone, so if you oh, want okay. to use this one, jump over, huh? Well, she can speak from here, right? Yeah. Ah, there we are. Okay, go ahead. Uh, th that's a very good question, because in fact, in the U.S., we did exactly that. GAP works through the Congress, through the courts, and, and through the press. So when we realized the situation that was occurring in the U.N., we went to the Congress, and the Congress conditioned the U.S. contribution to every U.N. agency fund program, 15% of the U.S. contribution, and the U.S. is the biggest single donor, to the UN is conditioned on the effective implementation of best practice whistleblower protection um, measures. And the Congress will not release, according to the law, will not release the entire contribution to the UN until the Secretary of State certifies that these whistleblower protection practices are implemented. So John Kerry sent a report, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, sent a report to the U.S. Congress in August certifying that every U.N. agency, fund, and program was implementing best practice whistleblower protections. Although the content of the report he gave was patently false. They are not implementing best practice whistleblower protection. They have the policy, but they don't implement it. We went and we met with the congressional offices that are responsible for dispersing the funds, and they said, well, if the Secretary of State certifies it, we have to go ahead and release it. And the State Department in the U.S. certifies the most preposterous things. During the, the Central American Wars, the State Department certified there were no human rights abuses in in, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua. So um, that's where we are. And that's why we're back to the press. The press then has to bring, pressure the government to pressure the executive agencies to hold the UN to account. 